Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Dr. Deanna Minnick. Welcome to another one of our expert interview series. We are having, as you probably know, if you've been following these for some time, and even if you haven't, you can still go to our theana.org page and look at all of the different video interviews that we've been doing. Today, we have Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who is a board-certified cardiologist, a certified bioenergetic psychotherapist, and a certified nutrition specialist. How unique is that to actually have a physician who is well-versed in nutrition? So I, I know that we're going to have a great discussion. I know Dr. Sinatra very well. I've uh, co-published some papers with him about nutrition and cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. along with some of our colleagues, Dr. Uh, Mark Houston and others. And so um, welcome, Dr. Sinatra. It sounds like you're in the middle of some thunderstorms. Yes, where we at. are. That's what Florida is like, thunderstorms. <laughs> but thunderstorms. it's fun. <laughs> well, how, what, what is the situation there with COVID-19, the, the pandemic? How has this pandemic affected your life? It hasn't been bad at all. I mean, um, there's about 25,000 cases in Florida. Um, in the, in the community I live, there's a million people and there's about, oh, about 500 people with the illness, which is minimal when you consider there's a million people in this whole area of Pinellas County. And it's been about, oh, maybe around 40 deaths, you know? So it's, it's really, I mean, you know, when I, whenever somebody dies, it's horrible. I mean, uh, uh, but when I look back on my history of being a doctor for over 40 years, you know, I graduated medical school in 1972. I can remember doing all the flu-like outbreaks. I had a lot of people uh, in the hospital on ventilators. Uh, they would get comorbidities. In other words, they get an inflammation in the lung. It could spread to the heart. We call it myocarditis. Uh, I've seen hypertensive episodes from uh, flu-like illnesses. So in a way, I'm used to it. In other words, this is not new for me because, you know, when any endemic occurred, I always saw a, ra a rise in, uh, you know, CCU admissions, ICU admissions in the middle of the night, early a.m. I mean, you, not, you name it. I mean, I used to work sometimes like a dog during these epidemics when I was practicing cardiology on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you currently seeing patients uh, right now? No, I mean, what I'm, what I'm doing now is I, I basically um, answer patients' questions. Uh, now, when I, when I go back to Connecticut, I, I have a slew of uh, children that I took care of. They were like kids waiting for heart transplants when I was in my 40s and 50s, <laughs> you know, 60s, so to speak. Now in my early 70s. And a lot of these kids have refused heart transplantation many times now. Uh, because I put them on metabolic cardiology back then. I used D-ribose, carnitine, coenzyme Q10, magnesium. And I've always believed that when I use these four nutrients, um, I drove ATP in a preferential direction. And now with the work coming out on exosomes and stem cells and everything else, I have a feeling there's communication going on between ATP, you know, the breath of life, so to speak, you know, our, our energy of life, and these precursors to stem cells. So somebody will do that research in the future, but I, I really believe whenever you support ATP, you're reconnecting on a stem cell level, our own intrinsic stem cells or our exosomes. And uh, I believe these kids are actually developing stronger and newer hearts the longer they live. And, and this has been shown in research in New England Journal and Scandinavian literature about stem cells rejuvenating heart cells. Uh, that, or these heart cell stem cells that we all have even until we're about 80 to 90 years old. So it's really amazing. Well, and what's interesting about stem cells and what we know about the research, at least in part, is that by fasting or doing a fasting mimicking diet, we can stimulate a lot of the cellular debris and even stimulate st stem cells, right? I mean, if we look at, you know, what are the dietary factors? What can we do from a nutritional standpoint to create better energetics in the body to ward off viruses, to help our immune system. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to, to take you down the path here of um, all of your knowledge and wisdom. How, how would we look at bioenergetics as it relates to helping the immune system? What might we do nutritionally to bolster it? Well, I, I've always been a big believer in the Mediterranean diet. Um, 
you know, as a heart specialist, I studied it for years. And uh, I don't know if you were at the, uh, you know, the nutrition meeting about six or seven years ago, where I had Dr. Gonzalez speak with me there. Yes. Um, he was the architect of basically that study that came out. That was a pre-demand study, basically. Yes. And it's come under some criticisms and fire and, you know, and, but, you know, it's been in and out of all the journals in Europe and back and forth in the New England Journal. And it's still holding up. I mean, it's holding up. Now, Deanna, if you look at even the Mediterranean basin, I mean, if you look at the longevity belt of the entire world, there are more hundred year old plus people in the Mediterranean basin than the entire world. You know, whether you live in Libya, Sicily, Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, Greece, it doesn't matter. So there's something special about that Mediterranean basin. Um, and I've always believed that uh, I thought olive oil was one of the secret sources of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and, the, and again, the Mediterranean diet is sort of a non-inflammatory diet. And, and when the pre-demand study came out, and if you look at the study, you know, a third of the people took the American Heart Association low-fat diet. A third ate a lot of nuts like the seven-day Adventists do. And, and we've shown that in America, that seven-day Adventists have a paucity of heart disease, and they eat a lot of fat. You know, there's a lot of fat in nuts, whether it's, you know, polyunsaturated, even some saturated, even some saturated uh, fats are found in nuts. You know, a lot of monounsaturated fats are found. Uh, but then the olive oil studies have blown me away, especially the genetic studies, you know, which show that, if you do take in olive oil, you're toning down pro-inflammatory genes that we all have. I mean, we're all born with pro-inflammatory genes. But if you can reverse those genes with olive oil, oh my gosh, and you, and you tone down the inflammation, because we've always realized that inflammation is the root cause of heart disease. It's inflammatory, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative disease. So keeping inflammation at bay, I think, is really the secret sauce of the 21st century. And that's why I'm all in on olive oil. Yeah, and I want to drill down into olive oil because I get lots of questions. There are questions about whether or not olive oil on the market has been adulterated, what kinds of olive oil to get. One of the things that I know about olive oil just from doing my dissertation work on fatty acids is that the, the fatty acids in olive oil are actually non-essential. So is it really about the fats or is it about something else that came along for the ride with that olive oil? So give us kind of a primer on olive oil. What do you look for when it comes to an anti-inflammatory oil? Well, I'm a big fan of the California olive oils, first of all. Uh, and why is that? Uh, the reason being is uh, when 60 Minutes ran that show about four or five years ago, on the Italian olive oils and some of the other European olive oils being adulterated with canola oil, yeah. that sent a chill through my spine because, um, you know, years ago, about 25 years ago, I used to think canola oil was healthy for you. And Deanna, I'll never forget this. I was chief of cardiology at my institution and I sent an article to Connecticut Medicine. This is about 25 years ago about HDL cholesterol, antioxidants and oxid oxidized LDL and all, you know, all that stuff. In, in, in inflammatory cardiovascular disease. And this professor from Yale, he liked my paper, but he said, I'm turning your paper down because you're recommending canola oil. And I go, I was crushed. But then he said to me, I said, if you're willing to reverse your position, and he sent me a whole bunch of articles, I'll tell you, Deanna, 25 years ago, it was like a baptism by fire, but I, I read all these articles and I realized that canola oil was a big hoax. You know, I bought into it myself as a, even being chief of cardiology. And I realized after I did all this research and I read all these papers that canola oil is good for machines, but it's not good for the human body. So when the Italians uh, adulterated their olive oil, or some of the Italians, I mean, I think the mafia was involved. I mean, you know, there's stories all over the place, but when the olive oil was adulterated, then I went to the California Growers Council in California because they won't certify your olive oil unless it's 100% extra virgin. And uh, they test it, you know, against other oils and, and they do taste tests and they do chemical analysis on it. So I'm all in on a monounsaturated olive oil because, you know, monounsaturated fats, they, they bring a lot to the table. You don't get the insulin response that you get, you know, with, with carbohydrates or... Uh, you know, I mean, proteins, you might get a slight insulin response, 
But again, you know, you and I both know that insulin is a pro-inflammatory hormone and surges of insulin up or down is really one of the keys of optimizing our health. If you can keep insulin levels at bay and look, you know, do you remember when the, uh, uh, I guess the American Heart Association and other, the, the American College of Physicians and all these uh, agencies, they lowered the blood pressure. Remember when it used to be like, <laughs> you know, 100, then it went down to 90. <laughs> Now it's going down to 70, you know, a fasting blood sugar. So that's interesting. What about unfiltered olive oil? Because, you know, when I look at some of the research and transcriptomics on the olive oils, it's, it's really about the polyphenols that I can see from that research. And so yeah. do you usually look for unfiltered olive oils? Is that important? Does it have to have uh, certain things on the label for you to want to purchase it? Well, you know, when, when I was in Italy years ago, this is way, this is like 20, 30 years ago, just before any of this stuff came out, uh, I, I used to taste the unfiltered olive oils when I, when I was there, and I liked them. But They're but, bitter, aren't they? They're very astringent. They're yeah, different. Uh, you yeah. know, they could have more oleopurin in it, you know, and more polyphenols. But, you know, the color of it disturbed me, you know, because they're cloudy and stuff like yeah. that. So. <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of unfiltered olive oil. So right now, I, I like clean, adulterated, un unadulterated. I, I, I like clear olive oils. And, uh, um, you know, that's why, you know, I've gone with California. I'm all in on California. I think the California Growers Council does a superb job of regulating, you know, the olive oils in California. That's good to know. Well, I know that our colleague, Dr. Mark Houston, takes several tablespoons of olive, olive oil per day, you know, just as, you know, just separate as a therapeutic agent. So I, I know that there are so many cardiologists who really do appreciate and see the benefit of including olive oil into the diet. Yeah, that's the pre-demet study, you know, better yeah. HDLs, less inflammatory LDLs, Better separation, less Alzheimer's disease, less cancer, less neurodegenerative disease, less diabetes. I mean, the list goes on and on. So, so what um, about red wine? I know in the PREDIMED trial, you focus mainly on olive oil and nuts. And I'm wondering about red wine, which is another feature of the Mediterranean diet. Is that good or bad for our immune system? What Should everybody be drinking red wine? Well, to a degree, it's okay. I mean, you got to realize, I mean, look at the French, for example. The French have one of the highest cholesterols in Europe. The average French cholesterol runs about 270, 275, but they have one of the lowest incidences of coronary artery disease in Europe, you know, which is kind of interesting, you know, sort of, it sort of disputes the cholesterol hypothesis and coronary artery disease. But the French drink a lot of red wine and red wine can prevent, you know, the oxidation of LDL and things like that. And red wine contains all these proanthrocyanins and resveratrol and all these great ingredients. But remember this, Deanna, the French have the highest incidence of cirrhosis in the world. <laughs> so now you're trading, you know, because you're trading cirrhosis of the liver for lower heart disease. And, and remember, you know, I, I I've spoken to a lot of French people about this. I mean, a lot of the French people bring up their children on red wine. You know, the, you know, a lot of these, uh, these, you know, these connoisseurs of wines that that uh, the, the waiters in some of these restaurants that are just they have a palate that's incredible. Uh, I was in Bermuda years ago, and I spoke to one of these sommeliers, and uh, he was French, came from France. And he won so many contests where they blindfold you, where you're an incredible taster. And he was phenomenal. He was only like 25 years old. And I asked him, how long have you been drinking red wine to get all this experience? <laughs> he goes, ever since I was eight years old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, again, it shows you that the French can bring their children up that way. Yeah. But I like moderation. If you want to have a glass of wine every mm -hmm. other day, you know, or five days a week, maybe up to a maximum of two. That's okay with me. That's okay with me. Well, Not it's a sign that we can get resveratrol from other sources, like grape juice. It doesn't have to be fermented into alcohol in order to get the benefit of resveratrol. Uh, right. and I, I get concerned about the role of alcohol on leaky gut and changing the microbiome, too. So right. I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense, that it has to be personalized. Yeah, when it comes to alcohol, less is more. Yeah. I mean, I, I firmly believe that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on, 
on less alcohol. And I've seen a lot of alcohol-related cardiomyopathy. I mean, look, Deanna, the holiday heart syndrome. You know what that is? That's atrial fibrillation, hypertensive crisis, arrhythmias. You know when it occurs? During, from Thanksgiving to New Year's, and you know, maybe a week after, because a lot of people drink more alcohol then. And I've seen so many admissions to the ER, you know, with these comorbidities of arrhythmias and heart attack and all, all these things from overindulgence in alcohol. So That's as a heart specialist, I've, I've seen the worst of it, believe me. Yeah, I know you have. Uh, well, to that point, what about, before we went on live, we were talking a little bit about dietary fat. So I know that fat has been a maligned macronutrient, and perhaps it doesn't need to be because we need to see it through that personalized lens. But as I was mentioning to you that there was just a paper that was published talking about high dietary saturated fat provoking inflammation. So maybe we can break that down for everybody within this nutrition community, what do we need to know about saturated fat? Do we need to have some precautions? Uh, what are the current recommendations? What do you th do and think for yourself as it relates to saturated fat? Well, you know, I mean, saturated fat has a, has a bad connotation. It came out of the Ansel Keys data and all this stuff years ago. Uh, because saturated fat is really broken down to cholesterol in the body. So if you believe the cholesterol hypothesis, the saturated fat works. I personally worry about saturated fat because of toxins. In, in other yes. words, environmental toxins tend to reside in, in saturated fats. And uh, so when it comes to saturated fats for myself, my family, you know, my patients, less is more. Okay. The good thing about saturated fat is it doesn't elicit an insulin response. So if you're a high carb person and you're eating sweets and carbs and you're not eating fats, that's worse, you know? So it's all about moderation, Deanna. That, I mean, that's the way I put it. I mean, if you want to use five or 10% saturated fats in your diet, it doesn't bother me. I like more monounsaturated fats. I love the polyunsaturated fats. I like squid oil, fish oil. You know, I like the omega threes. You know, they, they bring a lot to the table. They're anti-inflammatory. So basically, um, I'm not going to throw saturated fats under the bus, but I'm not going to endorse them to the fact that you're eating tons and tons of ice cream and you're doing. <laughs> You know, what about coconut sweets. oil? You know, right? Yeah, now, coconut oil as well. I mean, halo. Yeah, I mean, I like coconut, but again, if you abuse it like alcohol, uh, it could have a downside. I mean, um, but if you're using coconut in lieu of carbohydrate, I'd rather see you lose use more coconut than carbohydrate, simple carbohydrate. That is, I mean, right now we're sort of like splitting hairs. Um, I, I think the ideal diet is about 35% fat, maybe about 35% carbohydrate, and maybe about a third protein, you know, maybe 25 to 35% protein. I mean, that's, that's what I like. Because remember, fats and proteins, you don't get the insulin response. And you probably know more about this than I do. You know, this is where you based your PhD on. But, you know, fats and proteins, you don't get the mammoth insulin response that you do get with, you know, carbohydrates. And as a heart specialist, we know that endothelial cell unfriendliness or endothelial cell dysfunction or surges of insulin, you know, creating inflammation of blood vessels is, is really the key to, uh, you know, heart disease and atherosclerosis, you know, this whole inflammatory cascade. Absolutely. And on the flip side of that, I think about an anti-inflammatory way of eating, which in my world is eating the rainbow. It's making sure that we have all the colorful pigments from plants. Oh, yeah. And if you look at the Mediterranean diet, isn't that what we're seeing is that it's all about bringing in plants together with those saturated fats. So not to have just one thing in extreme amounts, but to have it as part of a composite. So I'm a huge fan of plants and I think you are too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I am. In fact, uh, um, one of my members of my family had breast cancer and mm. she was in her young forties. And I really researched the literature on this. Uh, this is years ago. And uh, it's amazing that um, if you take lycopene in tomato, you know, and, um, you know, I make my own tomato sauces and stuff like that. I mean, commercially as well, you know, I do my wines, tomato sauces, olive oils. I do, I do all this stuff. It's amazing. But like when I researched the literature and I looked at, you know, sulforaphane and broccoli. And if, if you look at, you know, males get prostate cancer, women get breast cancer. But if you eat, 
lycopene and tomato or tomato sauce. Uh, and at the same meal, you're taking in sulforaphane from broccoli. The combination of the lycopene sulforaphane, you get an incredible synergistic response and it's anti-cancerous. It prevents cancer. And, and the literature supports it, whether it's prostate in the male or breast cancer in the female. So when this person in my family developed breast cancer, whenever she came to my house, Deanna, I would always have tomato sauce, pasta, and broccoli for her, hands down. I cooked <laughs> organic broccoli and, you know, my own sauces. So, you know, I'm a big believer in the rainbow of nutrition like, like you mentioned. Yeah, and I love what you're mentioning about synergy, about food synergy, plant synergy, phytochemicals coming together and being potentiated. And what you just said about cancer, cancer shares so many of the same processes as cardiovascular disease. Oh, yeah. The bedrock is inflammation. So I, I would like to shift the topic just a little bit because um, you are such an amazing, I just wish people could get a window into your amazingness because I've oh. known you for years, oh. I've seen you lecture. And what I find unique about many cardiologists is that they go beyond food and into looking at emotions. They look at the broader context of one's life. And one of the things that um, I, I know you to be very, very much an advocate of is connecting to nature, making sure that we are grounded, that we're earthed, that we look at our emotional health, our mental, spiritual health. So I'm wondering if you'd like to um, end our interview by speaking a little bit to the other dimensions of cardiovascular disease and even health within this COVID-19 crisis, which is impacting the heart, broken heart syndrome. You know, we oh think of gosh, the long yeah. grief. And so yeah. what would you like to say about all of the lifestyle aspects of the heart? Well, I, I wrote the book Heartbreak and Heart Disease in my early 40s, and that was my best book ever. Uh, it took me 20 years to write that book, by the way. Uh, wow. I, I was in a gestalt psychotherapy training program when I was a fellow in cardiology. So I was studying with Fritz Perl's disciples um, in, from California. And um, when I was in my second year of gestalt certification, uh, I read a book by Alexander Lowen called Bioenergetics. It was part of the reading list for gestalt. Deanna, it was the most incredible book I've ever read. And uh, I realized that Al Lowen was only a few hours from me. He lived near New York City. And um, there was a workshop that was in New York City, and there was 100 people in it. And I just attended it. I just, you know, sent my, my tuition in, and I drove a few hours out of New York City. Deanna, there were only three Americans in the entire workshop. Oh, my goodness. There were maybe a dozen people from China maybe about a handful from Australia, maybe 50 from South America, 30 from Western Europe. And I'm going, oh my gosh, how lucky am I? All these people had to fly into New York City to hear Alexander Lowen. So as fate would have it um, in the workshop, I ended up doing a piece of work. You know, uh, you know he, he knew I was an American. It was only three Americans in the workshop. So he asked me to, to work with him. And after I worked with him, I realized that um, he was a gift to me. He was placed in my path for a reason. So then I ended up doing a 10-year study of bioenergetic psychoanalysis. And um, I spent 10 years studying that type of psychotherapy. I became certified as a bioenergetic you know, analyst. <laughs> and now I'm certified and now I'm in my early 40s and uh, then I, I published a book, Heartbreak and Heart Disease, because I realized that heartbreak, emotional heartbreak is at the core of heart disease for many of us, you know, for, I mean for lots of us. And I published stuff in the literature. We, we did biochemical assays of people in workshops and we used to collect epinephrines and norepinephrines and cortisols in the urines. And I published that in the literature. And what we showed, Deanna, was that people who don't cry, you know, like women in the workplace right now, they're becoming more like men, so to speak. Um, they don't cry. And uh, women have surpassed men with heart disease, for example. Um, so what we learned in the workshop was that we had all these men and women, and uh, a lot of them had heart disease and a lot of them didn't. 
But when we broke the codes and we collected urines and all these people, what I realized was that women who networked with one another, who cried with one another, who hugged one another, who, who you know, just went through the empathy of their, of their traumas, you know, with one another. When we broke the codes, they had no cortisol in the urine, no adrenaline. They had no heart disease. They had no high blood pressure. They had no arrhythmias. Then we broke the code on men. And there was five men in there that had advanced heart disease. And all of them had high cortisol levels, high adrenaline levels. Not one of them cried in the workshop. They were like lumps of clay. I would say to them as a psychotherapist and as a heart specialist, well, how are you feeling? Fine, fine. Really? Your body is like this. You know, you're guarded. No, no, I'm, I'm okay, doc. I'm okay. And then when we broke the codes, they had hypertension, arrhythmias, heart disease, previous heart attack, bypass surgery. So look, the body <laughs> from, from here up lies. <laughs> from here down tells the truth. In other words, you know, it's the body never lies. The body never lies. And um, uh, these men who were living in a false self, so to speak, and what I had to do for all of these men that were in the workshop was get them into other workshops and get them to feel their deep sorrow that we all have. See, everybody has deep sorrow. I mean, I can tell you that as a psychotherapist. I mean, a lot of us cover it up. A lot of us act in a false self. A lot of us is buried, you know, but it always comes out in the heart. It always comes out in the heart because the heart is the storage of our emotional passions, our energies. It's stored in our heart. And the heart math people know this. And, and, and I mean, this conversation is between the brain and the heart through the vagus nerve and all this stuff. So I think the healthiest thing you can do to prevent heart disease, Deanna, is have a good cry. Mm. Crying re will release the heartbreak that we've all had as children. And when we, when we release that heartbreak, it can free us up from getting heart disease. So that's my, that's my tip of the day on heartbreak and heart disease. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm one of the, um, the people that I would say I over cry, you know, Oh, I, good. You all come I, down with I, heart disease. Then. So now I feel really good about this because yes, you want to do it, but you know, from heart disease. They studied <laughs> endorphins and tears and you know more about that stuff than I yes, do. But cytokines. We release. Inflammatory yes. You're releasing cytokines. inflammatory mediators and there's, and, and there's good endorphins and tears. You release those and yeah. Uh, oxytocin and the love hormone and all that stuff it's amazing stuff i gotta tell you it's just absolutely amazing so anyway what i wanted to close on on is covid19 there's pushback about ace inhibitors and uh ace receptor sites in the lung and i'll tell you there's been a lot going on but you know i have family members um actually three family members on both sides of my family who take ACE inhibitors, okay. and the European societies are telling people to get off them, the American societies are telling people to stay on them. My position on this is when the dust settles on COVID-19, because all these comorbidities, right? If you have high blood okay. pressure, you, you have a more of a risk for you know, COVID-19. If you have diabetes, because of all the inflammation in your body, you're more at risk. But I think when the dust settles on this first go, go around, if people, if ACE inhibitors are a factor, we'll know about it because somebody's going to study it retrospectively. You know what Absolutely. I mean? So what I would tell our audience is that whatever comorbidities you have, overweight status, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, emotional stress, I mean, the list could go on and on. At least you can control those comorbidities. You know, yes. if you're 10 pounds overweight, sure, you could go on a diet. Remember, when you lose weight, you're, lo you're losing inflammatory cytokines and fat cells. So you're losing those messengers. So I, I think that COVID-19, if there's a reframe in a COVID-19 pandemic, it's this. Less carbohydrates, less sugar, healthier weight, less emotional stress, pray more, get out in the sun, ground more. You know, in other words, there, there can be a shift where we can reframe the pandemic to get us into a healthier you know, uh, ways of healing, whether it's earthing and grounding or vitamin D from the sunlight. I mean, the list goes on and on.
You know, I mean, I could talk forever, you know, <laughs> even in Bach flower remedies. I think there's some nice remedies there that can work with, uh, you know, COVID-19. So, you know, uh, we can get wild on this, but I think if we stay middle of the road and just uh, take out less sugar and put in more healthier, uh, you know, nutrition into our body, that's a, a great place to start. It is a great place to start. And much of what you just spoke to really rings true with what Dr. Jeff Bland said a couple of days ago, which is that COVID-19 is not so much a viral disease, it's a lifestyle disease. And so as part of this, how do we create this as an initiative to get healthy, to get well? And even those of us who feel like we walk the talk, I'm sure that there are things that we can be improving on even more. You know, maybe less tech time, maybe more nature time, more family time. There's always something that we could be doing to create that ripple effect. And you just said it so beautifully. There are so many different paths into that process and it can be personalized. That's what the ANA really stands by is how do we make health a personalized venture? That's what it's all about. I mean, it is. It truly the is. The ANA, our position should be, we tell people to not only be your own doctor, but if you have to have a doctor, assist your doctor into getting well. You know, I used to love my patients when they used to take charge of their own health. And my greatest words to a patient was, I'll see you in a year. <laughs> because you're doing such a good job, I don't need to see you, you know. And that's, you know, that, that was my mantra with the patients. Well, and a doctor as teacher, right? And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And allowing the patient to find their own way and guiding them. And I'll tell you, it goes both ways. My patients were my greatest teachers. Some of my patients would be coming in with bags of vitamins and minerals. If I didn't know about it, I'd research it. I'd look at it. They'd be coming in with articles. And my patients educated me a lot. So I'm, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate. Well, I have to say, you are truly um, one of my favorite docs. Uh, you probably oh, know that, but I, I, I look at your Facebook page. The information that you present is always high integrity. It's, uh, it's forthright. You know, you, you come from the place of just telling people where you're at with certain things. And I've always appreciated your very holistic framework around being healthy, as you just mentioned. So thank you so much. This has been such a delight. Like I mentioned to you, I was looking forward to talking with you today. I woke oh, great. up. Great, yeah. Wow, I get to talk we, with Dr. Sinatra. Well, whatever you want, we can do it again. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's one thing about COVID-19. I have a lot more time on my hands. <laughs> well, and I'm not lecturing like on the circuit now, which is good. I'm not traveling by airplane. I yeah, even grew a beard, sure you know, just like the Civil like War it. guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you, you look a bit different. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I haven't yeah, shaved, you know. Looks good. Looks good. Well, All right, well, it was great talking to you, Deanna. God bless, and we'll do it next time, you know. Absolutely. And I just want to close this call very quickly by saying that the ANA is the professional home for the science and practice of personalized nutrition. And if you're enjoying this interview series, you can find all of the recordings on the website and other great content by becoming a member of the ANA. The website is the ana.org. So thanks, Dr. Sinatra. Thank you all. Stay healthy and well, and we'll see you next time. All right, bye -bye. Deanna. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.